Welcome to the Feast of Tabernacles this October the 24th, 2013. It's being held at uh, Frank Nelson Park, Panama City, Florida, it's being hosted by the Congregation of Yahweh, Panama City, Florida. Before I start today, I want to uh, just reiterate a few things. Chiefly being is, when I give the presentation today, think this question. What would Aaron do, I mean, what did Aaron know, and when did he know it? I'm going to talk about the calendar today, some little nuances that I've discovered since the last time I gave this message. But while I do it, I wish you would consider what, did, what Aaron knew and when he knew it. It's a cliche, and you hear it around political circles a lot, but it kind of applies to what's going on today. About a month ago, uh, two months ago now, uh, I applied to go to the Unity Conference uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and uh, I was asked to submit a paper. It came out, the invitation, the solicitation for authors came out in the Faith Magazine, which they published, and uh, I don't know, I didn't read it or misplace it or something, but they gave a second notice a month later. To that one I responded and I sent the requisite number of uh, uh, papers, of 20 copies, and uh, of course a lot of other people responded. And the long and the short of it is I didn't get uh, accepted, and, uh, but it wasn't for lack of trying. So I came back here and uh, got a telephone call, and it was from a gentleman over in Tallahassee, which is about 90 miles west of here. And he said, well, I just got through looking at your website, and wow, uh, very pleased to hear that uh, y'all have a, a sacred name uh, group there in Panama City. I come there a lot with my family, and uh, you know, just wonderful. I said, well, okay, we're, it's coming Sabbath, please join us. He said, well, I can't this coming Sabbath because I'm meeting with another group up in Vernon. Vernon is about 60 miles north of here, and they... They have a retreat up there, and it was uh, the, the retreat was name of it was Dogwood Acres. Well, when Sabbath came, uh, we met at Bernice's house, where we Sunday's house. Where you at, Bernice? <laughs> we had we had met at Bernice's house, and it was pouring down, raining. It, I mean, it was raining. So when a, a little break in the rain came after the service was over, I got in my car. I had to go over to the beach anyway to check on something. And I got to thinking, well, you know, I'm here. Why not just drive up to Vernon? And so I did. I drove up to Vernon, found this place, went in there. It's, it was very nice. I uh, have modern uh, cabins. Uh, they're duplexes, and they're made one above the other so you can sleep a lot of people. A lot of, I don't think, four miles of of trails up there and they have fishing ponds and stuff, stuff like that. It's, it was a community uh, gathering hall, they have a worship center uh, and a cafeteria so they can you know so, sort of take care of uh, people for a week or two at a time without without the women folks having to cook and do because you know it's it's no retreat for the women if the women have to cook. So. Well uh, uh, a sermon was not a sermon, but a, a teaching was going on at the time. And when I walked in, uh, you know, like here, when the back door opens, everybody looks around. So I sat down in the back, and about halfway through, the lady who was giving it, who happened to be the wife of the pastor, uh, she suggested that they take a break, and uh, so they did. And at that time, I approached the uh, the leader. Who it turns out, both uh, the lady who was given uh, the message, uh, the little teaching, and he had visited our congregation in 2010. I had their name recorded in a little book. <laughs> so that's why I urge you to sign up. <laughs> um, and so I said, uh, I just came up here, just as a fling. I didn't even know if I could find a place, but while I'm here, I would I respectfully request a copy of your uh, rationale, formal copy of your rationale for determining the scriptural year. 
and uh, a lot of people heard it and there were, he had none and a, a lot of congregations don't have them. I have written, I sent 12 emails out and mailed one letter to Israel requesting the same thing, a very polite little request. And I always, uh, in, in, in requesting their rationale, I always attach to the bottom of, e of the email our rationale. And, and that rationale is uh, preserved in a paper here, which I, and I'll read you the, the rationale. There's only nine steps. But well, um, it was an, a, an experience for me because uh, uh, none of the 13 inquiries resulted in a rationale. Not one, 13, not one. So I'm asking myself, perhaps what I should have done at the Unity Conference was to send out a, a global <laughs> invitation to everybody send their formal rationales. And of course, they might not have gotten any either. But <laughs> so, uh, and I'm gonna go now to the, to the rationale that we use. And I, I urge that if you come in contact with others and, and, and other uh, assemblies, to urge them to formally write down their rationale. And uh, so I'll start, I'll start with ours. Now, now, it's important that the rationale be written down. It's especially important for the leader of the congregation because it's his responsibility to lead the congregation in the right direction, to know when the feast days are and and how to celebrate them. You know, like for example, we fast for the Feast of Atonement, for the Day of Atonement. Things like that, details like that. And every male in an organization ought to know how to do it. It's, re it's relatively simple. But the burden is on us guys. It is uh, every, every female, adult female, should know the principles of it and 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 choose to if they choose to be able to do it some of that is some of the reasons for doing so is in case the minister cannot give the sermon on very short notice cannot give a sermon on very short notice somebody who has given sermons has to step in and as part of the male when you're born male that's part of the responsibilities, stepping up to the plate. Now, um, if you want to do research in this matter, there are two publications uh, that I will mention here, and, and I, they're free, available off the internet. You can download them. One of them is uh, 350 pages, so you might want to just read it and the other one's only about 40 pages much easier to read but the first one is titled uh, treatise on the biblical calendar second edition the abbreviation is tcb2 and it's by herb salinsky herb salinsky excellent 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 um, I, I have had conversations with Herb and found out just within the past week that he was coming down here, which would have been really great. We could have picked his brain, but there was a, a family matter that he had to attend to, and so he went uh, an, another place closer to his house. The second one is the observed calendar of the Second Temple by uh, era by Wayne L. Atchison. It's 41 pages, and. Uh, either of these can be downloaded. I'll give you the URL if you're interested in doing so. Now, in Genesis 1:14 to 18, you don't have to turn there. Uh, Elohim uh, gave mankind three visible celestial objects, sources of light, and you know they are the sun, the moon and the stars also. And he gave them to mankind, not just the Israelites, he gave them to mankind for four purposes, for signs, for seasons, for days and years. Your Bible might say signs, set times, 
days and years. But essentially, uh, the interpreter's choice of, of words. We must recall that in ancient times, the Israelites, they were primarily engaged in uh, animal husbandry. When they entered the promised land, they became engaged in agriculture. So uh, being outdoors, both from the uh, animal requirements and the crop requirements, uh, they knew a lot about things that we don't know. And they handed it down from generation to generation. For example, shepherds lying in the field. They didn't have TV. They looked up at the stars, the biggest TV screen in the world, wheeling overhead. And they began to uh, notice things. And this information was passed down. And one thing they noticed was, uh, in every 29 and a half days, there was a new moon crescent. A sliver, highly bright, poly, like a scimitar, a bright polished sword, which is one of the definitions. And they noted the poles, uh, they noted the dippers and the other uh, constellations. And they also noted that uh, these constellations fell approximately 30 degrees apart. And that is called a zodiac, not to be confused with a horoscope. Now, they use the same thing, but that pattern of stars is called a zodiac. And some places in Israel, little small synagogues away from Jerusalem, it's in tile in the floor. So, uh, you know, it's not, if you were a Catholic, it's not a mortal sin to say zodiac, because <laughs> Uh, it's a fact of life. When, it, when you get right down to it though, uh, the responsibility for determining the scriptural calendar was Moses' brother Aaron. Moses' brother Aaron. That's how far back it goes. Why was it Moses' brother Aaron's responsibility to determine the scriptural calendar? Because he was told, the Almighty Yahweh tells Moses, tell your brother, he's not to come into the set-apart place at all times, lest he die. For I am in the cloud above the mercy seat. And my presence is in the cloud. When I, somebody told me uh, <laughs> that, I can assure you, I would calculate the calendar and I would not delegate the task to anyone, lest they make a mistake. And I feel sure you, you think the same way. So, uh, all of the time that uh, Moses was high priest, his sons were also high priests, recall that two of them died. The, high, the line of the high priest could only be of the sons of Aaron, only be of the seed of Aaron is what you're is what your Bible probably says, which meant his sons and his sons' sons and so forth. And this held true almost up until uh, 70 AD when the temple was destroyed. Now there was some corruption uh, toward the end, but the fact of the matter is, is it, was, it was to be by his sons, by Aaron's sons, because the Almighty Yahweh tells uh, Moses that Aaron is to be high priest to minister to him. So and he commanded Moses to anoint and consecrate Aaron and his sons, the consecrated sons. Aaron was to be high priest. The four sons initially were to be ministering priests. All the rest of the Levites were to be priests. So now I'll go over the rationale with you that we use. And uh, I'm 99 and 9 tenths percent sure Aaron used, and I will support that with evidence in just a moment. Item number one, a day is reckoned from sunset to sunset. You know, we know from Genesis, it was the evening and the morning and the sixth day and so forth. In the beginning of time was matter. Before their matter was created, there was no time. There was no time. We live, we live in a, uh, uh, 
a system which depends upon the decay of energy, enthalpy. It goes from a higher state to a lower state to a lower state to a lower state. If you take and get some uh, iron ore and you have it smelted till you end up with a piece of iron, it isn't, it isn't in a stable condition. It wants to combine with oxygen, and it will. And it becomes iron, uh, becomes rust, and pretty soon it's right back to where it started. At that, that's the lowest level, the lowest energy level. So a day is reckoned from sunset to sunset. Does anybody not believe that? Surely not, or you wouldn't be here. A week consists of seven days referred to as the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and the sixth is called the eve of the Sabbath, and the seventh is called the Sabbath, or Hashabbat. It's defined as a rest or an intermission. Third criteria, Tekufa. There isn't a Hebrew word for, the, for the, uh, Tekufa. It's taken commonly as equinox. And the spring equinox is the one that's calendar in the northern hemisphere, is the one that's calendar pertinent to us. The equinox is one of two days a year when the sun's shadow moves east to west in a straight line. And that straight line is from the center of the earth through the equator straight to the sun as the earth is orbiting the sun. It's instantaneous, but it's in a straight line. The earth goes around on the other side of the sun, same thing happens in reverse. Instantaneous, that's the autumnal equinox. Imagine, for example, this little yellow dot is the sun. And you can't see it, but the little blue thing out here is Earth. The Earth, of course, is revolving counterclockwise around the sun. And the Earth is rotating counterclockwise on its axis. Now, I can show you here why uh, this matter needs to be carefully considered before going to print in it. Here's a publication from the Jehovah Witnesses, and you can see they look similar. But if you'll notice here, there's an arrow which shows that this goes clockwise, and that's incorrect. There's also one similar to this on paleotimes.org's web, web page. This is not circular. It may appear circular to you, but it's, a, it's an ellipse. An ellipse is de defined as a geometric figure with two foci. The sun is one, and there's the other. And the two are separated by three million miles. Therefore, if this were the spring equinox, and it could be, I could have drawn it here or there, it doesn't make any difference. I just chose that point. The spring equinox, if, it, if the Earth started here and went around to the autumnal equinox right here, it would require 186 days because of the offset. It has to travel further. Conversely, from the autumnal equinox around to the spring equinox, 179 days. That's why winter seems shorter than summer. If you look at the... Um, if you, if, you, if you then take and, and said, well, Anthony, before you said that the, uh, uh, the moons, the, and that's what they were called, not months, they were called moons. The moons are not less than 29 days, not more than uh, 30, and there are 12 of them. Well, if, you know, you do the math, average it out to 12 and a half, uh, uh, 29 and a half days per moon or per lunar month. So if you assign 30 days to this one, and that was how it was done, 30, 29, 30, 29, 30, 29, 
you come up with an average of 29 and a half days. Here's six months. Okay. Well, <clears throat> here's the autumnal equinox, so there's a space here of a couple of days. Simply because uh, 29 and a half times six is less than half of 365.24, and that's the number of days that it takes for Earth to go around the sun. 365.24. That's why every four years you have to have a leap year. Well, everybody wonders, <laughs> where do you get the fraction of the day? You know, I woke up this morning, I woke up yesterday, where's the fraction of the day? The fraction of the day is in time. It's in time. You know, as we know, in the days of Noah, started on the second day of, uh, the 15th day of the second month, and he ended his voyage on the 15th day of the seventh month. And therefore, he was gone 150 days. Divide 150 uh, by the number of months, and you see those months had 30 days, 30 days each. And, and it's very likely that the orbit of the Earth was, three, was uh, 365 days, or 360 days, rather, even. Well, various people have said, how come that happened? I honestly don't know. Some have said, when sin entered into the world, that these things started to go, go into confusion. Be that as it may, if you, if you continue the lunar months around to here, you end up with a difference between a solar year of 10.87 days. 10.87 days. So if you superimpose the lunar solar year over the solar year, which is, which, which is this band here, you have this gap. Now, that comes into play, as far as the scriptural calendar concerns, this way. If you start the calendar on, at the sunset of the day of the spring equinox, let me explain why at the sunset of the day of the spring equinox. The equinoxes and the solstices are the last day of the season ending. The last day of the season ending. The reason for that is, is if a day begins in the winter and it ends the, on the other side of the spring equinox, since it begins in the winter, it's a day of winter. And there's no such thing as fractional days. It begins in the winter, therefore it is a day of winter until it ends. But however you reckon it, midnight to midnight, sunset to sunset, it is the last day of the season ending. A summer solstice is the last day of the spring. And it's the same thing for the other cardinal points. Most people don't accept that, don't know that. So when congregations hold their feast days before the spring equinox, they are one, holding the year, beginning the year in the winter, and they're beginning it in the month of Adar. The Bible very clearly says, this month shall be the first of months to you. And then it turns right around and it names that month, Aviv. Well, <laughs> if it says it can't begin in the winter because it's the 12th month, uh, and it's the winter and it's the month of Adar, then the criteria is wrong. It must begin in the spring. It's the month of spring. You say, well, Anthony, how do you know that it's spring? Well, there's a, there's a number of ways. You recall the account of, uh, of uh, Joshua taking the Israelites across the Jordan. And the priests walked out into the Jordan and the water welled up on one side and surely drained away on the other since it was going downhill. And they stood in the stream until all the Israelites and their herds and their wagons and all that crossed over. And then they walked over to the promised land and when they did, the water flushed in and overflowed its banks. Because it was being, it was coming from melted snow and it was building up higher and higher and higher. But it didn't flow until the st priest stepped out of the, out of the Jordan River. Uh, little little uh, items like this are not commonly taught in Sunday school. And 
and uh, we're fortunate in that we have looked into them and we under we we understand them now the scriptural year begins with the first new moon crescent seen after the sunset of the day of the spring equinox and it is reckoned and declared by the high priest in Jerusalem. Declared by the high priest, not the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was a civil body. The high priest was the one who decided was religious matters. And that's important because you see it, and I used to use it myself, I was wrong. Herb Selinsky pointed it out to me one day, and it's in his book. So it was determined by the high priest and it was declared. When did he declare it? He declared it at high noon. Now, the temple faced due east. How do we know this? Because in the scriptures it says that there were about 20 men that were on the porch of the temple with their backs to the door of the temple facing the rising sun. They were worshiping, it's a sunrise service, I suppose. But they were facing the rising sun. It was an insult to have their back to the temple. Well, when the sun rose, as I said, it comes up in a straight line. It rose up, went into the door of the temple. As the sun rose, went over the top of the temple and sat down on the west, behind it. That motion is called apparent motion. The sun doesn't move. It's apparent motion. And we use the terms every day, even though we really know that it doesn't, uh, that it does not move. Okay. Now, if a scriptural year starts before the day of the equinox, before the day of the equinox, it would be in the winter. I'll show you. Suppose, for example, you started the year here. You go around, and the year ends here. If you were to start the year here, you would be starting the year in the winter. You cannot do that. So, what is done? What, what would Aaron do? He would add an indicator. He would go to the next new moon. So here you have what you've probably heard of before. You have a door one and a door two. Sometimes it's called via door. Now this moon, this moon is inserted between the 12th month and the 11th month. It's not put on the end. It's inserted in between the two. So that this month, a door, will always be the last month of the year because there's some Jewish holidays in there, Feast of Dedication and Purim, and by tradition, they always had it in the end of the year. Those holidays are not in Leviticus 23. They're to the tradition of men. <coughs> so, now you've got, now you've got the, uh, the intercalary month in place. Now if you start the year here, goes around, and it comes up short again. So then you start the year here, go around, and it falls short again. Go around, fall short again. You have to have another intercalary month. That's why about every three years, you have to have an intercalary month added to the lunar calendar. Now, Aaron just simply went to the next new moon. That's what he did. You know, no big calculations, no, no tables or anything like that. He just simply went to the next new moon. But what would be the effect? Well, if it, he would move the calendar from here I mean, the next new moon would fall here, start the calendar here. Just simply do it over and over. 
So that's why I was saying earlier that it's good to know the principles, but it isn't necessary that you become uh, some sort of an expert. Now let's see, we're on eight. Each weekly and annual Kodesh Mikra, that's Hebrew for Holy Convocation, in Leviticus 23, 1 to 41, is observed with all applicable uh, ordinances and statutes. All applicable ordinances and statutes. Now, as you know, there are statutes uh, that are in the 613 thou shalt not uh, that are, have somebody has collected out of the Old Testament. There's some that apply to animals. There's some that apply to the sacrifice of animals. There's some that apply to women and so forth and so on. But the destruction of the temple and the priesthood, many of these have gone away. But some have not. Eating clean, not eating pork, is one that has not gone away. If we, if we uh, count our blessings, and I can tell you this morning, everyone in this room, including me, have received a blessing, and I'll tell you what it is. We all woke up this morning. That's the truth. Hallelujah. Hey guys, some of you that are over 70, that's a blessing. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we are the recipient of so many blessings, we can't even imagine the number. It is, it's, it's infinitesimal. It just, it's just mind-boggling how, how blessed we are and how blessed we are to know what Aaron had to do for the entire nation of Israel. Now, if Aaron did it wrong, he'd be dead. But we know that he died a natural death and he was buried. And uh, <laughs> there's no record of any of the high priests after Aaron that died in the Holy of Holies. No record. And I can assure you, with as many en enemies that Israel had, that they would have been, there would have been a record. Now, the United States Naval Observatory is a really handy site to go to because there's some, there's been so many people that have written to them about things, biblical matters. And one of them happens to be uh, about the days around The days around uh, the beginning of a scriptural year. Those periods those periods are called epochs. Epochs of time, periods of time. I'd like you to read, if you can see it, the preamble to this table. So this table gives Julian calendar dates. And when you look at, it, at events that took place uh, up to about 250 AD, you're, you're, you're into the Julian calendar. Invented by Julius Caesar, who got his information from the Egyptians. It says, the table below gives the Julian calendar dates in Greenwich times of the astronomical vernal equinox for the years 25 BCE to 38 CE inclusive. The second table gives for years the Julian calendar dates in Greenwich times of the astronomical full moons, which you're not interested in, which occurred on or after the date of the equinox and dates and times of the astronomical new moons, that's the one we are interested in, on or preceding and after. That's the two epochs. On or preceding and after. The on or preceding is in the winter. The after is in the spring. So if you see a, an author who talks about a date for the beginning of the year and it's on or after 
and it's not correct. The United States Naval Observatory just shown us here it's not the correct epoch. It is only on or before or after. On or before puts us clearly in the winter, after clearly in the spring, and the demarcation line is the sunset. Well, using this information, one can go through and determine uh, the date of our Savior's birth, uh, death. And we know that, of course, it was on a Wednesday, and we know that it was in 31 CE, and we know that simply because we use the new moon crescent. Now, others use the conjunction. And you gotta remember that a lot of the confusion that's going around today is a result of one guy, Herbert W. Armstrong. He taught the Worldwide Church of God that because the Bible says that the Jews were given the oracles, that that included uh, the calendar, the Jewish calendar. Jewish calendar didn't come into existence until about 380 to 450 AD after the birth of our Savior. 380 years after the birth of our Savior. It was not an Old Testament item. It was after. And therefore, uh, when he, when he, and he stuck with it for something like 40 years. The error that is in the calculated Jewish calendar, and there is an error, is based upon the fact that the Athenian astronomer Hippocrates calculated the interval between uh, uh, conjunctions. Now, this was not being done for religious purposes. The Greeks were idolaters. This was a mathematical challenge. It's like, why do you climb the mountain? Because it's there. Well, this was a mathematical challenge, and uh, it was really surprising how accurate, over many years, they were able to get the interval. And that interval is, has a very small error of about two or three minutes. And it's reflected in the Jewish calendar of today. The rabbis know about it, but they, they will not change it because of tradition and because there's no Sanhedrin. Well, it's quite likely there never will be a, trans, uh, uh, a, a Sanhedrin. Seventy elders. Very likely there will not be a Sanhedrin. Therefore, the error will remain. So some years, that's why the Jews are on, uh, about on the same page as we are, and other years they're about a month away. Because Hillel, who's the one who published the, the Jewish calendar, he knew that there was a small error, and so what he did was is he advanced the calendar one moon. One moon. And over the years, the error has eaten into that advancement such that in another 200 years, it'll be right, right on sync. But the, that, that's the case. Now, if we, if we look at this uh, view graph, uh, visual aid here, you'll see that superimposed, uh, battery's dead, superimposed on the solar calendar here are the crops. Now, even though this calendar shifts, the crops don't because they're affected by the heat of the earth. When you go from winter to spring, ground temperature gets uh, increases, and things sprout up and they grow. And, that, and so you might be observing uh, Passover, I'll take a worst case, let's say that you started the calendar year, the new moon happened to fall right here. You would be observing uh, Days of Unleavened Bread and Passover and so forth here instead of there. This thing moves back and forth depending upon whether you add the intercalary, intercalary year and, and the advancement because of this short difference between the solar year and the lunar year. 
Here's something that uh, a lot of people who have alternate calendar uh, rationales overlook. If you start the calendar before the spring equinox, let's say here, because there's a theory going around that says you can start the calendar uh, on the new moon closest to the spring equinox. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere. Here's what happens when you do. There have been two recorded instances where Passover, right here, actually fell a day before the spring equinox, clearly in the winter. The lamb was taken clearly in the winter. The year began clearly in the winter. But down here, look what happens. The autumn feast, trumpets, atonement, tabernacles, last day, are before the autumnal equinox. Now in the Bible, it very clearly says, I think it's Exodus 30, uh, it talks about uh, gather, uh, it talks about the end gathering. And that was the, uh, vegetables. This was when the barley and the flax were harvested. This is, was when the winter wheat was harvested. And then you had olives and things like that that were harvested in this area. And they did it, it, it was done that way, I'm sure, by the Almighty Yahweh, so that these these things could be preserved and eaten uh, later on. They dried them out, dried prunes, uh, dried figs, dried dates. <laughs> so they would sell these and come and pay their third tithe. Pay their first tithe at Passover, second tithe at Shavuot, or the Feast of Weeks, also known as the Day of Sabbath. And the third tithe would be, right now, would be after the uh, after the autumnal equinox, so the Almighty Yahweh designed this perfectly. All it, all we have to do is just learn it, and that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm sorry to say uh, is lacking. But that's why we do what we do. A couple of more things. There's folks who say, uh, I'm, wait, I'm sorry, before I get away from this, let, uh, let me mention something that you will not hear mentioned by people who advocate barley. They always want to know about, well, you got to have barley. Do, do, do. Barley has nothing to do with the beginning of the year. It has a great deal to do with the wave sheath, but not the beginning of the year. Barley grows, 80, it takes 89 days. All of the people who are advocating barley, and the gentleman that I spoke to in Grand Rapids, he says, well, we go by the barley. And you, you may remember that Jacob Meyer from the Assemblies of Yahweh in Bethel, Pennsylvania, used to go to Israel every year, and there would be a picture of him in uh, the Sacred Aim Broadcasting, and he's plucking uh, barley. The barley that um, the Israelites first pluck when they entered uh, the promised land was domesticated barley, two-row barley. Wild barley grows differently, a little differently. The rate at which barley grows is often a function of the elevation where it happens to be at. But when is the barley planted? If you ask these people who are barley advocates, they never tell you because they don't know. Well, the answer is right here in Alfred Erdersheim's book, uh, The Temple, Its Ministries and Services. And now this has no, no comparison to scripture, but it does indicate the culture and the times and the practices. Here's the footnote. This is from the Mishnah, the Menachot, I think it's chapter three, section one and two. Quote, the field was to be plowed in the autumn and sown 70 days before Passover. How did the barley farmers know when to sow? No pun intended. But uh, they knew about the crescent moon. They had seen it since they were 
little kids. They knew all about it, backwards and forward. And that's one of the reasons why the detailed instructions for determining scriptural calendar is not written in the Bible. Everybody knew it. It didn't require any calculations or anything like that. You just looked up. The moon was there. It was a month. Seventy days before Passover. Now, as I said a while ago, barley has an 89-day growth cycle. 89 days. So you subtract 70 from 89, and you come up with a 19-day margin. So, if you sowed your barley in here, in this area, it would be sown after the early rains. Everybody remembers that phrase in the Bible? You have the early rains and the latter rain. If you have the early rains, the soil softens, you plow it, you can be plowed, and when it get more rain and or snow, you uh, irrigate the, the seeds, the seeds germinate in the coal. Here we have winter wheat in this country. Same thing happens. You put seed in the ground uh, about a month from now, a month and a half from now, and it germinates in that cold, frozen soil sometimes. The snow waters it. Well, as you, as you start to come around and the soil warms, growth starts to take place rapidly. Well, the kernels will not fill out unless there's the latter rains. Unless you have latter rain. If you don't have any rain, you won't have any, any barley. Just, just the way it works, or wheat. So, you have the early rain, and then you have the sowing of the barley, and it's cold, this part of the year is cold and it's rainy, and then uh, you get thunderstorms and so forth, and then as it starts to get warmer, you get these rains, and then after, right after the spring equinox, then you have the harvest of the barley and the flax. Uh, the jardin over, overflows its blank. Why? Because of melting snow. Uh, as, as the year progresses on, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. The wheat comes up and the wheat is, dr is, is dried on the stalk. Whereas barley was hand sickle, was hand cut, and it was put in shocks in the, in the field. And they would work their way up or from one side to the other, and they'd come back and get them, the, they had dried out more. If you let the barley get yellow in the kernels, and you hit it with a sickle, all the kernels are going to fall off on the ground. Even a strong wind will do it. Today, however, in Israel, you have uh, Hybrid barley, four rows. They let it get very dry because they mechanically harvest it. That's the way modern times have gone. Now, when the when the uh, after the when the uh, Assyrians took the ten tribes, and then later on the Babylonians took the remaining tribes into captivity. Um, they were in captivity, what, 40 years? 70 years. 70 years. One year for every Sabbath they polluted. One year for every Sabbath they polluted. Now, some folks hold their, you know, their nose up at Babylon, but they have to remember that it was the Almighty who directed that to happen. And it was the Almighty who directed the then king to issue an order, I think it was order Xerxes, to go back and rebuild Jerusalem after 70 years. So he was the instrument of the Almighty Yahweh. Does everybody see that? While they were in captivity, while they were in captivity, a couple of things happened. First of all, they found out that the Babylonians began their year after the spring equinox. And they reckon the first month to the new moon crescent. How do I know that? <coughs> well, my stepdaughter went to Florida State University and she was home one, uh, one weekend and I said, see if they've got a copy of Babylonian chronology 626 BC 
to AD 75. Well, somebody in the faculty had checked it out. And it took about a month, but she stayed on it. And she, one day she brought me the, the book and I ran down to uh, get it duplicated and I've been carrying it ever since. I'm pleased to announce that just the other day, I happened to notice that it has been reprinted. I think it's six bucks for anybody that would like to buy. It. This is the difference between a single side reproduction, but I think I got it on Amazon. Six bucks. Now, now for the proof. All of the time, what did we say, 70 years? That the Israelites were in captivity and then released. Have you noticed that there is no history books that say there was a big upheaval, there was a revolt about the calendar, there was fighting and so forth. You know, not one word, not one word. Why? Well, the Israelites found out that the Babylonians were reckoning the year exactly the same way that they did. Do you want proof? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> In these tables, in these tables here, you find the, I think it's, I, I thought it was 8,900, but I believe it's actually 8,400 continuous, underline, underline, continuous recording on little clay tablets of the New Moon Crescent every month. 8,400 recorded new moon crescent recordings. That's what you call hard evidence. The uh, translation of these tablets is a very interesting story in itself and it's part of it is dealt with in here. But we are blessed that these people who put this together, did the translating and so forth, uh, has done it for us. And that's why I can say this congregation confidently knows the way that we ob uh, observe the calendar is correct. And since you're here, I believe the same thing applies to you. And if anybody doesn't believe it, well, I'm sorry. Uh, occasionally we will have uh, uh, people question, well, what, what did the uh, what did the high priest do? Well, he did really a couple of things. I told you about the calendar. He did that for self-preservation. He didn't want to die. Neither did his successors. Well, <clears throat> thought somebody liked it so much they took it home. <laughs> Okay, now I use this sometimes <laughs> uh, during Passover and, and the holidays that are associated with Passover, like the Days of Unleavened Bread, because it shows a couple of things. Um, this is the first month of Eid, and I got this out of a book that was published by Frederick Coulter. Some of you from Worldwide probably remember his name. He and, and, he and uh, Herbert W. Armstrong had a disagreement about things, and so he just said goodbye and left. Well, he wasn't the only one. Frank W. Nelty, who attended Ambassador College, went to South Africa, had a disagreement with Herbert W. Armstrong, he left. He joined the United Church of God. Uh, Ernest Martin, uh, author of the book, The Star That Astonished the World. If you'd like to know uh, what the star was, well, it was the conjunction, a triple conjunction of planets. And planets move, stars don't. In a very interesting book. And it's not baloney, because here you have a recognized author, Joseph Seiss, who writ who's written a book, and it relates to stars. Remember, sun, the moon, and the stars? Well. There is a, uh, a great deal of information that can be gleaned from reading these authors. But uh, Coulter uh, and, let's see, the other fellow's name was uh, Sorensen. 
they put this chart together. Now, I don't know if they were the originators of it or if they got it uh, uh, from somebody else and improved on it or whatnot. But if you'll turn to Exodus 16, 1 to 30. See what a nice guy I am. I didn't, hadn't been making you track through your Bible ever since I got up here. This is the first time. Exodus 16, 1 to 30. Well, when you read that account, you see that the quail were sent at sunset and the manna appeared the next day, in morning. And then they're told, you gather a double portion because on the next day there isn't going to be any. Well, you know, from the, from the Bible it says some went out and, and gathered it and it bred worms and it stank. Well, that double portion was, was uh, gathered on Friday, on what we would today call Friday, or the eve of the Sabbath. The, the quail, they landed after sunset on the Sabbath. And with the Sabbath day, it's at sunset, so guess what? It's the next day. That's the way we reckon it, sunset to sunset. Quail come in, they're actually harvesting the quail on the first day of the week. Sunset to sunset. So they would you know, just take them and wring their necks and pile them up. I've, I've gone a little quail hunting myself, not much. We have the little Mexican boys and they can, they can take them, uh, a bunch of quail and they can uh, pile that high. And I think we paid them a peso a piece, I believe it was. And they'll cut the breast and, put their thumbs in it and flip the breast out and you get a piece of meat about that big, very tasty piece of meat and the rest of it they would just take home and give them to their mama. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, 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 is Moses is telling Yahweh, who already knows of course, you know, why did you give me these people? They're pain in the neck. And uh, so anyway, he tells them, you know, just go back and tell them they'll have meat in the evening and they'll have bread in the morning and so it happened that way now the quails when they fly across uh, the Red Sea and, and in a flyaway zone there sometimes they encounter a headwind and the poor things will be flying like crazy and maybe be moving backwards so that by the time they finally were able to get to the other side they were just fatigued and when they landed in the camp they were easy, easy pickings. What this chart also shows, so go back to uh, the known event that, that this is the Sabbath. You count backwards, you count backwards, you come to the first day of Aviv. You count forwards and you come to the Feast of Weeks, which is when the Ten Commandments are given. So let's, let's look at this for a moment. The, the count to Shavuot, to the Feast of Weeks, also called the Day of Sabbath, begins on the first day after the Sabbath within, that falls within the, the seven days of unleavened bread. Let's look at that. The Exodus began here. This was the first day of unleavened bread. Exodus, Exodus, Exodus. Here's the Sabbath. What's the next day after the Sabbath? This day. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's week number one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Week number two. Week number three, four, five. The seventh week. You have seven weeks. Complete weeks they shall be. Seven complete weeks. There are no fractions here. Seven times seven is 49. The Bible says... Complete weeks they shall be, and the morrow thereof. That makes it a hundred. Uh, makes it fifty days. Makes it fifty days. So, it, 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 when it's laid out like this, it's very clear. This teaching, though, is not something that's very common. In fact, I didn't know about it until we requested from from Coulter uh, some of these books, and we actually bought a case or two. The same chart, the same exact chart, shows something else. Our Savior was executed on Passover. Now the black part here is night and the white part is day. 
Passover on the 14th begins here, which is at the sunset of the 13th. He had Last Supper. He went out on the mount. He was arrested, not by Roman soldiers. If you have that in your Bible, it's incorrect. He was arrested by temple guards. Temple guards, not Roman soldiers. How do we know that? Well, first of all, <laughs> they took him to Ananias, right? A Roman soldier worth his salt would have done the, the Jews' bidding by taking him to the high priest. No way. <laughs> Secondly, uh, after the event, there were some accusations that that these, quote, soldiers had went to sleep and that the apostles had come in and stole the body. Wrong again. If you, went to, if you were a Roman soldier and you went to sleep, you were dead. You were dead. It wasn't, it wasn't, well, we'll give you another chance or something like that. No, because the risk to the other soldiers was so great. If you slept as a, if you were on a sentry, you slept, you were the classic example of dead meat. So, this is also uh, what happened when the first exodus, uh, when the first Passover took place. Passover was on the 14th, on the 15th, uh, at the night of the 15th, as it says, they left Egypt by night. So they left here and they traveled day and night. Till they got out of the the, uh, the general area of Egypt. Now Egypt in those days consisted really of the civilized part. Uh, the wilderness was wilderness. It wasn't really part of Egypt. T today it is. But once once they got past the last town that's mentioned in the scriptures, they left Ramses, and when they got past the last town. They were out of Egypt, even though they physically were, were on the ground today. That, that Sinai Peninsula had a road called the King's Highway. I believe it's even mentioned in the scriptures. Not very many people went that way. It's a pretty harsh trip because of the heat and so forth. But it was not unoccupied. There were copper mines in the Sinai, and they found evidence of them. They found ev evidence of them uh, smelting. There were graphite mines. The graphite was so precious that only the royal royalty could use it to, to write with. It just, it's just interesting that our Savior was crucified, uh, was executed on the 14th and buried just before sunset. Just before sunset. He rose as he prophesied. Three days and three nights. The little word and is frequently ignored. It's three days and three nights. 72 hours. Yet it's commonly taught that he was executed on Good Friday and he rose Sunday morning. Mathematically that's impossible. I know that now, but I can tell you for 45 years it just went right over the top of my head. It didn't, you know, didn't compute. <laughs> so he, when, he, when he arose, uh, three days and three nights later, he arose, if, if he, was, he was in tune just before sunset on, on, um, uh, at Passover, then he arose three days and three nights just before sunset of the Sabbath here. So he was already risen Sunday morning when the Bible says that Mary of Magdala came to the tomb. He was already risen. Stone was already rolled back. And, and, and it alludes to that, but it doesn't go into details. But if he is a liar, we have no salvation, no hope of salvation. Think about that for a moment. He is prophecy about himself was three days and three nights. And that is what happened. Now, a lot of, a lot of what we have today that's being taught uh, is, is traditions of men, not uh, scripture. Um, 
if, if you if you look down here, uh, this is the third month Savan, and the count to Shavuot that I just did was the way the Bible says to do it. However, the Jews today interpret this as meaning that this is this day. So they always start counting on the 16th, the day after the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as a consequence, there are fractional weeks. As a consequence, it almost always comes out the same day. So what's the use of counting? Again, here's another subtlety that's not commonly recognized. And that subtlety is this. If you, if you, um, if you do not calculate or, or count to the days, uh, to the um, Shaviot, if you do not count to Shaviot, then, then you're accepting a day that doesn't mean anything. But everyone here knows that we should count to Shaviot, and they know that we start to count here. Now, this day here, Passover, can occur on any day of the week. Any day of the week. But the count only starts on the day after the Sabbath, within the days of unleavened bread. Now, if you go through the scriptures, and I'll finish this up. If you go through the scriptures, it talks about that uh, they, the Israelites uh, uh, landed uh, in Israel on the same day of the week as they left Ramses. Well, go straight up. and Here's the day they left Ramses. It was the fifth day of the week. It was a Thursday. They were arrived here. And then what does the Bible say to do? wash your clothes and sanctify yourselves. They would have washed their clothes here. They would not have washed their clothes here. Why? Because it's a Sabbath. Could not do work. Moses goes up on a mountain and is given the Ten Commandments. This is the exact same time frame. In the New Testament, this is Pentecost, which in the Greek is count 50. 50 days. This is 7 times 7 is 49. This is the 50th day. So, if you, um, if you have friends and you have an opportunity, keep in mind some of the things that are facts. Um, it is very clear, I think, to anyone who studies the facts that you must begin the, the scriptural year after the spring equinox. And again, uh, as I said earlier, what did Aaron know and when did he know it? He knew the sun, the moon, and the stars, three luminaries, sources of light, and he knew the four purposes that they were to be used for, signs, for seasons, days, and years. And I cannot see, but I know that it happens, how people can't comprehend this. When I went up at Vernon, it didn't make any difference. People believe what they want to believe. But if we know better, we're duty bound to gently share what we know. Thank you.